much. So, um, well, first of all, thank you um, for a wonderful program and, and fantastic hospitality. Um, I'm here to tell you about, um, and actually this sort of falls in very nicely after what uh, Jason was talking about. We are very interested to see whether you can actually uh, separate the dissociative from the um, ethical uh, efficacy uh, readouts for our ketamine. Um, so just to, to start, do I point it there? Okay, so um, one thing that they don't tell you when your parent company goes public is that their lawyers start getting paid by the word. Um, so, so just please don't make any investment decisions on things that we say today. Um, just my disclosure, I am an employee of Perception and I'm a shareholder in both um, the company as well as it, its parent company, Atai. So uh, Perception was founded um, in uh, New York City uh, about in 2017. Uh, Jonathan stepped out, but Jonathan was the founder. He uh, licensed in technology from Kenji Hashimoto's lab at, at Chiba University. Um, in 2018, Atai Life Sciences made a substantial investment, which um, gave them majority uh, control. We're interested in focusing on potential therapies for neuropsychiatric diseases. And our formulation of our ketamine is PCN 101. Um, and that is currently in a phase 2 a uh, trial for, for uh, treatment resistant depression. So um, I'm an organic chemist by training, which means even though you've seen the slide in various forms, this is actually the only slide I'm qualified to present. So bear with me for a minute. Um, so ketamine is a, is a racemate. So it a, it's a composition, a one-to-one -one composition of, of two mirror isomers. Um, we know about esketamine. Esketamine was approved in Europe about 25 years ago as an anesthetic. Um, and uh, it was much more recently, the nasal formulation was approved for TRD and MDD for, with suicidal ideation by, by Janssen. The drawback of this is the route of administration and the patient experience, um, the in-clinic experience. Um, we're interested in the other enantiomer. And what's interesting about this molecule is that it's about fourfold lower affinity for the NMDA receptor than, than the S enantiomer. Some of the potential advantages based on a lot of data is that um, we think that this could have enough separation between the um, psychomimetic side effects and the efficacy uh, that it would allow for potentially even at home use. Um, we know, we believe pretty strongly that the psychomimetic and dissociative effects are driven by the NMDA receptor, but there's a lot of preclinical data that. Um, that indicate in rodent mo molecules that uh, the efficacy and safety and duration of action is actually uh, superior than for S-ketamine. There's a, a, a beautiful paper um, by the Maryland and NIH groups in Nature in 2016. Their figure one in that paper um, shows three different models where uh, R-ketamine outperforms S-ketamine, either in terms of dose, duration of action, or um, or both in some cases uh, in um, animal models of, of depressive behavior and anxiety. Um, the title of this, this figure, and I love it, um, basically is that NMDA receptor inhibition does not explain the antidepressant effects of actions of ketamine. From my standpoint, we were a little bit agnostic on mechanism. We just want to see whether this is true or not and whether we can design a clinical hypothesis to, to test it. So this is essentially the short-term work that's going on at, at Perception. If you think sort of schematically about the level, the dose needed for efficacy and the dose needed to hit dissociative of side effects for esketamine, you, you have this very, very narrow window. If you have a situation where um, for our ketamine, if NMDA receptor antagonism is driving both, what you should see in clinical trials is exactly what Jason was talking about. You're just going to see a weaker S-ketamine. You're going to shift both of them up to, to a higher dose, but the relative differences between that, the window is going to be different. If you look, however, if for some reason NMDA is, or metabolism or something else is not driving efficacy, but it's still driving dissociation, 
it opens up the window that you will still push up the dose needed to see dissociation, but um, you could have the potential advantage of having something with a much broader therapeutic window. This is essentially the first two studies that we're running in clinical trials to test. So the, um, the goal of our phase one study that I'm gonna talk about today is to see how high we could push the dose of our ketamine before it became dissociative. Um, and we currently have, sorry, I have no idea what I'm pointing at right here. <laughs> oh, point here. Okay, there we go. Um, must have been bouncing up. The goal of the phase 2A study, which is currently ongoing in Europe, will open up US sites in, in April, is to see at what level um, do we start to see efficacy. So it's, it's our hope that by the end of this year, we will get a good idea of whether the drug is efficacious, and if so, what sort of therapeutic window um, can, we, can we start off with? So let me talk about um, the phase one study. It was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind single ascending dose study, now uh, looking at safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics of our formulation of our ketamine. There was a second part, which I don't have slides to, but I can talk a little bit about if you're interested, where we took a high dose of our ketamine and, and compared it to a dose of S-ketamine in, in, in healthy volunteers. The whole study was done in healthy volunteers. The drug was, or placebo, they were, um, administered via 40 minute IV infusion, safety and tolerability. We looked at CADS, we looked at MOAS, we looked at the BPRS plus studies as well as um, safety uh, endpoints. Um, and we'll put, I'll tell you a little bit about this, but the, the bottom line is that the study supported our decision to move into a phase two A proof of concept with uh, fixed 30 and, and 60 milligram doses. So this is the study design. We started at five milligrams and, and escalated up to 150 milligrams. Um, there were six active and two placebo in each group. At the end of each um, cohort, there was a safety review and uh, we decided whether or not to move up to the next higher dose. We were able to complete the study and the highest dose we were planning was 150 milligrams, and we were able to reach that, that dose. Okay, uh, pharmacokinetics, there are really no surprises here. Um, the pharmacokinetics of the IV dose were essentially linear up to about 100 milligram dose. You started to see a little bit of a blunting of Cmax and AUC at, a, at 150. Um, we also looked at uh, uh, metabolites, so um, nor, nor r ketamine and hydroxy nor r ketamine. Um, again, the pharmacokinetics follow what what you see. For, for there, there, there were no surprises there. And I can, if anyone's interested in the the metabolism, I can talk to you after the, afterwards. There were no serious adverse events. Um, there were, uh, you know, we we saw the things you see in a phase one study. Um, but they were not dose responsive. Um, the most common uh, treatment emergent adverse effects were uh, dizziness, headache, and fatigue. Uh, all of them were mild. We had one case of moderate vertigo in the 100 milligram dose, which, which resolved the same day. Um, and, and there were no discontinuations due to um, any treatment emergent adverse effects. So um, the only thing we really did see, which isn't a surprise, is a transient increase in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Um, let me just walk you through, because this is the way we're going to present the data um, for this. So what we, we have is um, the time points and then the various doses um, going from, in each larger box, you're going from the, well, the placebo's on the right, but you're going from the lowest to the highest dose. And so what you see is um, transient increases in blood pressure systolic on the, on the left, maximizing out at around 40 minutes, which is the end of the infusion, which is also the Tmax. Um, these are definitely in line with what you would see for ketamine or, or S-ketamine. So there really weren't any, any surprises here. Um, this is really sort of the meat of of the whole talk is what did we see and where do we start seeing dissociation? So um, 
again, we've looked at the, in, in this case, we're looking at the, the dissociated scale, uh, the CADS dissociative scale. And what you're starting to see is that at 15 and 40 minutes, so towards the uh, middle and the end of the infusion, you start to see um, dissociation at the high doses. Um, the mean scores for dissociation at 150 milligram in the CADS was around 14. Um, to put that in perspective, that's a, uh, that's a very similar number to what the um, biological psychiatry paper published by Singh, I think in 2016, saw for their 0.2 milligram per kilogram dose of S-ketamine. So this is 150 milligram fixed dose, so roughly 10 times higher. Um, the, uh, we, we also saw dissociation at, at 100 milligrams. Um, that was right at the cutoff that we have of about four. The, the mean value was right around four. And then at, at 60, 30, 15, and, um, and, and five, we, we saw um, all of the mean values were, were below the cutoff of four. Okay. Is there a men? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, nope. So I got to go back now. Okay. So if you look at the BPRS plus the positive symptoms, very, very similar score. We saw um, at 150 um, milligrams, um, you actually saw significant dissociation. Uh, the mean change from baseline was, I think, about 1.8. Um, at, the, at the 100 and, and 60, we saw a tiny little bit of around 0.2 unit change from baseline, and everything below that was, um, was basically flat. So again, um, we saw them, our ketamine, um, to Jason's point before, our ketamine is dissociative. You just have to push the dose up towards 100 milligrams or above. <laughs> okay, um, you look at a scale of sedation, uh, we saw very, very little sedation in the study. Um, the way this, this um, the scale works is you basically you go in, you say the patient's name, um, and if they respond right away, it, it's a score of five. If it takes them a second or two before they react, it's a four. And then it gets increasingly um, lower scores as they, they seem uh, further out of it. We only had a few patients who even um, had very, very mild uh, lethargic response to the name. Um, and, and those, again, were, were mostly at the high dose. So it's really not a sedative drug, at least not at, at any dose that, that we would be looking at. To put, put, to put this in perspective, um, as an anesthetic, esketamine can be dosed to up to three milligrams uh, per kilogram per hour. Um, and that's almost exactly what a 150 milligram dose of arketamine uh, dosed over 40 minutes would translate to. So this 150 milligram dose of S-ketamine uh, would be an anesthetic dose. So it, it's definitely um, a much cleaner compound, at least in terms of these side effects. We may need some batteries here. Okay. Um, so, um, so basically the conclusions here, and, and I'll, I'm happy to talk about the other studies that we're, do, we're, we're doing or we have done, but um, our goal was to find the maximum tolerated dose that we could bring forward. Um, we were really able to push the dose pretty high. The pharmacokinetics were pretty linear. Um, it was really safe and well tolerated up to 150 milligrams. Any effects we saw, which I didn't really mention, were transient. They, they were all gone within an hour to 90 minutes. So we picked the 30 and the 60 milligram dose. 30 is clearly a very clean sub dissociative dose. Uh, 60 is starting to sort of backstop it with a slightly higher dose that, that's starting to get on the borderline. Um, and these, these, these um, doses are now in, in phase 2A to demonstrate efficacy. Uh, and also for the long term, we're developing a subcutaneous formulation for, for future clinical studies. So that's everything that I had to say. I could talk a little bit about the, the second part of the study if people are interested. Otherwise, um, otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks,
So, um, so we're we can't talk about the specifics of how much, but but um, the trial is open in in Europe. Uh, we have randomized in those patients. We have um, opened an I and D up in the U.S. and we'll be adding U.S. sites uh, uh, very very soon within the next month or two. So our goal is to have the phase two A study done by the end of this year. That will be multiple administration. No, it's only a single dose, I, and it's a single dose IV study. The the goal is to demonstrate the rapidly acting effect, um, hopefully at one of these one or both of these doses. The two B study, which would we haven't put it on the calendar yet, but but hopefully uh, we could start it in in twenty twenty three. Um, that would be um, the, using the subcutaneous formulation, and it would be a multiple dose study. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting to see the the developments. Um, I was curious if you could speak to um, perhaps the reliability and some challenges that you might have had with all the scaling, because uh, that's certainly something that. Yeah where to actually go through that entire CADS as well as the BPRS, because it looked like basically every 15 minutes you were doing CADS or the BPRS. And my experience is often the nurse or the research coordinator is whizzing through it and not necessarily asking every single question. So if you think there might have been some missed dissociation, maybe, um, or any uh, comments on, on the challenges of the scaling itself in that short time frame. So uh, clearly, it's a very busy first hour, right? Um, you're doing a lot of things. Um, we were using actually a very good phase one unit in in um, in New Zealand, which was also this study was done in the first half of 2020. Um, running a study in New Zealand in the first half of 2020 made us look like geniuses because it was the only country in the world that that managed to shut down uh, COVID outbreaks. Um, but they were very, very good. Um, they were able to do it. They were able to do it um, well. And I don't think we had any problems with the quality. Um, maybe what we can do is maybe take this offline. Uh, one of our phase two clinical investigators is here, and maybe he can give a little bit more personal back feedback on, on how hectic it is. Any other questions? Sure. So, sorry, sorry, I stepped out for a minute, so I hope I didn't miss it. But you know, some of the earlier reports were saying that there was more of an anxiogenic component to S-ketamine than R-ketamine. Did you notice any difference there in anxiety at all? Or? I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm not sure it was measured. Um, Jonathan, do you know? Or? I mean, I, I don't think we measured. We didn't look specifically at anxiety um, beyond. Um, yeah, we we didn't, and we didn't we didn't look at any measures of of, um, of efficacy in this study too. These were healthy volunteers. Anxiety questioning BPRS. <clears throat> okay. Oh uh, yeah, but these are just the positive um, aspects of BPRS. I, I don't think anxiety was one of these. These are the BPRS plus scale. There's a question over there. Thank you. Also, uh, to comment to that, because the anti sedative component, uh, so the and if it would work. Would open a, a very a nice demand for this. I think I, it's certainly going to be looked at in the phase two study. So. <coughs> Any other questions or yeah. just on there, James? Yeah, hi, um, James Stone from Sussex. Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, interested to know. I guess with that higher dosing yeah, compared to S ketamine or racemin, uh, I wonder if you had any thoughts about potential side effects around bladder and so on. I, I know the dose. Uh, blood side effects from, um, yeah. I know the doses are used much lower than uh, in, 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 in the disease caffeine, but it's still a bit of an open question. Um, I, I don't have an answer to that, um, but I think it's certainly something we'll keep an eye out for, especially when we get into the, the larger trials. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Super clock. <laughs> <laughs>